right. We are now at that point in our service where we practice both alone and together our work of silence. And as Pastor Patrick was saying earlier, today is the Pride Caravan this afternoon. And on Tuesday, we kick off Pride Month. And I bring this up because so much of the work of queer liberation, queer pride, and queer joy begins for us, for us queer folk, in silence and solitude, really learning to listen and love who you are from every possible angle. So I want to invite you into that space today, particularly if you are planning to caravan with us later this afternoon as we get ready to launch into Pride Month. There's no real right or wrong way to do this, but I do invite you to place both feet firmly on the floor, on the ground, to feel your seat underneath your body. I want you to hear the birds chirping, the sun on your face, the wind on your skin. And as you engage this work, I simply want you to meditate on you are exactly as God created you to be. I'll ring the bell over here to begin our work. In about a minute or so, I'll ring the bell to bring us out. Let's practice this work alone and together. Good morning. Good morning. Our scripture reading today is from Psalms 29, 1 through 4, and verse 11. Ascribe to God, O heavenly beings, ascribe to God glory and strength. Ascribe to God the glory of her name. Worship God in holy splendor. The voice of God is over the waters. The God of glory thunders over mighty waters. The voice of God is powerful. His voice is full of majesty. May God give strength to all people. May God bless his people with peace. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the, our God endures forever.
I don't know if you all have noticed uh, Beverly's incredible work on the windows, but uh, you've got the lineup of speakers for the Evergreen Roads Institute. Uh, she's put them up there with her talents, um, and I'm so excited about what is to come, and especially for today, uh, to have two speakers um, to offer some words to us. Again, as I said earlier, you can keep, um, I'll turn that a little bit, <laughs> if that's helpful, or is it meant to be that way? Okay, I'll turn it a little bit so you can see the, uh, the visual aids from our folks, uh, and I will share uh, their presentation for those joining us online so you can uh, see some of the, um, the visuals that they have for us. It is a distinct honor and privilege to welcome Gisela Guerrero, who is a public health and community advocate. She is currently a bilingual wellness education coordinator at Church Health and a master's of public health student at the University of Memphis. Gisela is also active in community groups and organizations, including leading the Immigration and Inclusivity Committee at MICA. Huh? Can you help me coordinate the socios? Communitarios Coalition of Latin community leaders and stakeholders. These of interests include improving the health and overall well-being of the diverse and growing Latinx communities of Memphis and Shelby County. Throughout the pandemic, Isola has worked closely with the Communitarios Coalition members to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 in the Latinx communities by sharing information and resources. And leveraging connections. These efforts have led to broader and ongoing conversations with local makers on how to better the next communities. Thank you. Another blanket on. is a Rhodes alum and a graduate with a degree in urban studies. Iris continued her lifelong work to advance immigrant and refugee rights in the Mid South. It could turn up the heat. Labor transition into healthcare into the healthcare field, where she yes. developed and implemented inclusive sexual and reproductive health education curricula, and worked with regional partners to provide cultural awareness and humility training for professionals in the education and healthcare fields. In 2019, Iris returned to Rhodes College to support and expand on the work of study and the Lynn and Henry Turley Memphis Center. Iris has a unique insight into supporting students' academic and professional goals in the Mid-South and enjoys connecting community partners to students and other opportunities at Rhodes College, especially around issues of housing and economic justice. So join me in welcoming Iris and Hisela this morning. And I'm under five feet, so I'm going to use the mic, not on the podium. <laughs> so morning, all. Um, again, my name is Iris Mercado. I use uh, she, her, and Isha pronouns. Hi, my name is Gisela Guerrero. I also use she, her pronouns. All right, and today we're gonna to be talking about two things, um, power and poder, uh, because there's um, just a slight differences in the ways that we use power in English than the ways that we use uh, poder in, in Spanish, which is the language that we both speak, but it's not the only language that we speak within the Hispanic, Latino, Latinx community, and we'll get into that uh, because that tends to trip up a couple folks when we start talking about who we are and identity and why my identity is different in Memphis than it is in Miami, than it is in Argentina, which is where I'm originally from. So we're gonna get into that. So definitely we'll talk about that in, and I think we hope to share with the work that we've been doing with the Socios Comunitarios Coalition, we hope to share some tips, some guidance for you all, um, especially when we're talking about power. And I think a lot of it too is how do we empower those around us? So um, we'll get to something, hopefully that will be helpful, some takeaways for everybody. Um, so to start off, I think we just wanted to ask, I know this is only part two of the series, but kind of what, what do you all think when we think of power? What is your typical idea? What do you think of when you think of power? The ability to decide. The ability to be the decider. To be the decider. 
Momentum. Crouch down tree. All right. So um, in Spanish, uh, poder can translate to can or to be able to. Um, and it's ways that we have used poder within our own groups with socios comunitarios and, and within our own organizations and our family. Um, we all have poder. We, todo English today, <laughs> sorry. Um, we all have the power to do something. And so that's what we're going to talk about and uplift the different community groups, the stakeholders, those not traditionally associated or tied with a 501c3 and other official things with like, you know, business cards and name tags. Um, because we do have to recognize the power that we have and the power that we have within community. Um, those folks doing the grassroots works that are not often recognized. Um, that we want to shine a little light on so that when you start thinking about which organizations to connect to, whether it be outreach, whether it be to find new board members, new donor bases, um, you have a better understanding of just how big, how wide, how diverse we were talking about earlier, the Latino, Latinx, Hispanic community is in Memphis. So we're going to broaden that in just a moment. And also, I also gave you a preview of what the answer was going to be sorry about that. Um, so, how do you, you yourself, define as Latinx? What is Latinx to you? Are y'all familiar with this? Are y'all familiar with this? So, what do y'all? What? How would you describe this term if you were explaining it to somebody who hadn't seen it before? Start with the word diaspora. In some way. Can you explain to us what diaspora means to you? Definitely, we definitely try to compartmentalize as much as we can. Um, but I think, Edis, you might, in your work with culture humility, you might say, you know, we want to try to. Say, there's a there's a level, right, of where we do have categories to make it simpler to work, I guess. But. Yes, so we try, we often conflate nationality with cultural uh, aspects and geographic aspects, sure. All right, so. These are some other words that you may have also heard. So thank you so much. Um, Latino, Latina, Hispanic, Latinx, and Spanish. These are all slightly different and depending where in the country here in the US, within the continental US you are, you may have heard these more than others. Some of these may have some negative connotations, some positive connotations. Um, and again, depending on the generations that folks are coming into the US or have been here, they may associate different things within their own families. And even laws may have influenced the ways that they use some words. So on this next slide that I give you a preview of, um, and for those of you who are sitting at home on a couch in your pajamas, or those of you who are about to go sit on your, on your couches in your pajamas after this, we do have some links to some videos that you can watch. And for those of you who crave a little academic reading, we have a very short and sweet eight um, <laughs> article that is also gonna be linked to this PowerPoint that you can read on the differences and the history of how Hispanic came to be part of the US census back in the 80s break up. Um, this very new and growing population in the US that is fascinating. Even the first page, I'm hoping it will just hook you to read the next six pages. So 
goals, right? All right, so <laughs> we've got on this side uh, what Latino could include, what Hispanic can include, and if you remember your math, in the middle is both, right? So on one side, on the left, we have uh, Latino, which would include Brazil, and it does not include Spain. And then on the opposite side, can we have someone on this side that can read what is under Hispanic? <laughs> All right, and some folks here in the middle. What is what? Who who does typically identify as Latino and Hispanic? What's in the middle? A lot of different countries. <laughs> Too many to name. And this, we wanted to show this visual because when we think of here in Memphis, Hispanic or Latino, we typically think of just a few countries maybe some foods that we tend to eat when we're down on Summer Avenue. But the reality is that the Hispanic Latino population in the US is incredibly diverse. And it is also incredibly diverse here in Memphis. And I didn't know this. And we have a researcher here um, who made some beautiful graphs for us um, that are in the next slide. They're gonna break down um, our population here in Memphis in a little bit. Um, but we did wanna go back um, to the terms because I, don't necessarily use the same terms that Gisela uses, um, and neither does my sister. Um, we have very different ways that we identified, and that has been heavily because of where I grew up. So I was born and raised in Buenos Aires, Argentina, South America. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I was fine with it. Um, and then I moved to Mem or I moved first to Miami. So in Miami, I was racialized by, as an ethnically ambiguous person. So a lot of folks that I was Asian or Peruvian just because of who was geographically coming to Miami at that point in that past couple of decades in the 90s and the 80s. But when I moved to Memphis, Tennessee, I didn't even know where Memphis, Tennessee was. Um, now, the place I call home, the place I love, where my home is, where my friends are, where I went to school, um, folks decided to impose and read me um, as Central American, maybe Hispanic, depending on the year or the sun, sometimes Middle Eastern, the shade of, yeah, it just, we'll get into that in a minute. So um, here is just a little bit of history about terms. So Hispanic and Latino have been used interchangeably for many, many decades. Um, and various fields, including government and academia. And then the little sweet short eight page article is gonna go into why in the eighties, the US census decided to bring ethnicity because Hispanic is an ethnicity, not a race. So I am um, an indigenous, uh, to South American indigenous um, Hispanic person just because of the language that I used because Spain was colonized most of Latin America. And so therefore we use Spanish. Um, but uh, in the US, it has been used as a way to um, allow Hispanic people to maintain their ethnic identity, but also hold on to their whiteness. So when you are um, meeting a person, any one of you actually could be Hispanic. I would have no idea. There are a lot of white Hispanics in Memphis and in the rest of the country, just as there are a lot of um, Asian um, Hispanics in Puerto Rico, the largest population of Japanese, uh, Latinos are in Brazil, just like the largest Chinese population outside of China is in Peru. Um, so we've traveling through the rest of the country and meeting a lot of other Hispanic and Latinos has been enlightening for me, um, which is why we wanted to throw this information out to you um, in case you're not going to these wonderful cities and meeting all these wonderful folks. All right. So I think, I think uh, Latinx with the newer term, right? Um, that is somewhat, um, it's not formally, you know, academically, professionally used um, in all spaces yet, but I think that's where we're going. So Latinx, changing the O or the A at the end of Latina or Latina to an X is just to make it gender neutral, um, which is definitely something that is very difficult to do. Um, as you all may know, Spanish is a very, it's a binary language, right? It's everything is feminine or masculine, the nouns are. Um, so it's a very complicated process, um, but that's definitely one of the one of the ways that um, here in the U.S. that we're trying to move. Um, we use Latinx, I think, most often, um, but it's it's part of a process, right? Anytime language changes and evolves, to be more inclusive in this case, it's part of a process. 
Oh, yes. And the last point was just, um, so just thinking about, regardless of all of these terms, Latino, Latinx, Hispanic, or Pan-ethnic, um, like was being mentioned before, there's so much diversity within the Latinx community. Um, and actually, we are leaning now more towards just referring it as Latinx communities, plural, because it's so incredibly diverse. Here in Memphis, definitely, that's what we're learning more and more about. Um, and people don't associate with any of the terms. So I'm not sure that Hispanic works for everybody. I'm not sure that Latino works for everybody. Latinx doesn't work for everybody. Um, so one thing to consider is maybe we just need to allow people to identify themselves. And for a lot of people, what's most comfortable is identifying with their place of origin or country of origin. Um, so we've got the two links that I was mentioning below, one with the video and one with the reading. Um, so now we wanted to go into, thank you, um, what the Latinx communities look like in Shelby County. Um, if this were blown up, I would love for you to see all of the little tiny dots um, that represent um, the, the racial and ethnic demographics of the Shelby County. Um, there's also another link in the comments so you can see and view and play around. And if you're not from Memphis, you can look at your hometown and see how it's changed throughout the decades. You have that option to do that. Um, but one thing you'll notice um, is that obvious, it's the backwards C shape. You can see the um, black and white neighborhoods, very strategically located. I'm sure in the past with other presentations, you may have gone into housing or racial segregation, redlining. Uh, some of you are shaking your head, so those are familiar words to you. If not, we can link another link to <laughs> explain what redlining has looked like in Memphis and in Shelby County. Very short, very fascinating, keep you intrigued. So, um, but this one, the orange dots, orange yellowish dots represent the self-identified Hispanic population. And there isn't one particular neighborhood in Shelby County, it's, it's just, sprinkles all over the county um, for many different reasons that we don't have the ability to go into that today. Um, but that's why we emphasize that we're working with the Latinx communities in Shelby County. There's not one particular neighborhood like you would see in California or New York where there's particular boroughs, counties, or neighborhoods um, that you, you think of and you're like, oh yeah, like that, yeah, I know what that neighborhood is. I know what nationalities or ethnic or racial demographics are like over there. But in Memphis, it's incredibly different and it's incredibly diverse. So when we're talking about working with different community organizations, community stakeholders, we do need to go to, and I keep referring to this lady that may or may not exist, I'm sure she does, at the neighborhood um, level that knows everyone's business, she knows what's going on. Like that's the person that we are connecting with, those community stakeholders that know the community inside and out because they're the trusted source. Um, and so when we are working with our partners, we need to make sure that we're intentional about who we reach out to, who has gained, who, who is trustworthy in that community and make sure that we are coming in with the best of our, our, our intentions. So um, we try to have ears and eyes all over the county because we don't have a choice. <laughs> we don't have that many organizations working um, with the Lenox community in particular in Shelby County, um, which is why part of this today is to uplift the ones that are doing this type of work. Um, definitely. I think there are plenty of different communities that have different, so many, that bring so many different experiences. Um, when they immigrated here to Memphis, they may have, you know, besides coming from totally different countries, as we can see in the, in the next slide, I don't know to move forward. Um, uh, definitely Mexico is the most represented here in Shelby County, about 70%. But if we know that there's a growing, growing group of folks from different countries. Um, Honduras and Guatemala are significantly growing and they come with their own experiences, their own um, needs and, and also their own resources and, cap and capacities. Um, so that's one of the things that we wanna think about too is maybe there are folks who have been here for many years, 10, 20 years. And that's a totally different experience than the folks that are just arriving in the last year, two years, five years. Um, there's different needs in terms of what, why they came here, right? What was their reason for immigrating? Did they immigrate from another uh, U.S. state or are they immigrating from their country? And what was the reason for that? 
who are they here with? Did they bring their family? Did they bring a spouse? Did they bring children or are they here on their own? Are they here with an older sibling, for example? Um, and the other thing that we're constantly learning more about is language needs. Um, so yes, a huge portion of the folks speak Spanish, right? And that's why the term Hispanic, that's what it's most associated with is the Spanish language. If you're Hispanic, it's, you might speak Spanish or you do speak Spanish um, or your parents speak Spanish. But in this growingly diverse Latinx communities in Shelby County, we are seeing that there is a growing need for other languages uh, such as Ma and Quiche and others that we have yet to fully identify. Um, and these are some, some of the reasons that um, we, we don't know it all, right? We don't know it all, but we're constantly trying to reach out to new folks, constantly reaching out to new um, resources and stakeholders, people that are trusted, like Edis was mentioning, trusted uh, resources for information, and also trusted communicators. So folks that already know how to communicate with little smaller groups, subpopulations um, that have a lot of needs. We saw this a lot during the pandemic. Um, I'm sure y'all may have kept up with it, but there's a lot of times where certain communities were not being reached with the resources and testing and uh, vaccines and just sharing information, right? It was very hard to reach some folks. Um, and maybe there was one or two organizations or two people that organizations knew to reach out to, but that wasn't enough. And even now we're still seeing that, right? We're having a hard time reaching a lot of folks to get them vaccinated um, because we haven't yet identified all of the resources, all of the stakeholders that are available for us out there. All right, so we're gonna skip the submitting this on this beautiful chart. Um, uh, but if you can think of any of the Latinx organizations working here in Memphis or in Shelby County, can you say them out loud for us? Like, we just wanna know where you're at. Who do you know? Mariposas, yes. Mariposas Collective. Which one? Ooh, Clinica Esperanza, yes. And Latina Memphis. You know? And the Church Hill Center. All right, so um, last March around when the pandemic started, we started to realize that the way that the information was being disseminated wasn't the best way to reach the community. Um, so at that point about, I don't know, 20 different something organizations got together on a somewhat weekly basis and decided to create a system and network um, to get information out to the community. And that's what Socios Comunitarios is. Uh, now we have about, I don't know, like 70 different folks, like 30 something organizations um, connected. Um, so here are some of them and we'll share their information uh, with you later on um, with links and stuff. Um, so Poder in our community group looks a little different. We had to be very creative. We had different theater troops that you may be familiar with like Casa Teatro stepping in to work with organizations like Globe Honor to use their theater and creative knowledge and juices to create material um, about the vaccine, about COVID, um, that made sense for the community. I think another really cool thing that they just did, um, Casa Teatro, was they created a video um, with all of their all of the characters that they typically have, going through the vaccination process from the from how to schedule an appointment and going through the whole thing. What does the site look like? All to reach their audience, right? So we were talking about how they're stakeholders with certain uh, populations. And then finding a way to do it in a way that they already trust and a resource that they already, and a method that they already trust. So the coalition has done a lot of different things throughout the last year, reaching folks, same information that's already out there, but just bringing it to the community in a way that they will understand it and in a way that um, is, will be relatable to them. So we'll share all this wonderful knowledge with you all, in addition to a couple of tips of working with the Latinx communities across Memphis. Um, but one of the biggest points that we wanted to make, um, yes, we are wrapping up. I'm looking at all your signals under the table, um, is that when you are working with this population to address and dismantle language barriers, going where the community is physically, um, 
understanding, acknowledging the levels of existing capacity, the resources, and just the power that already exists in the community, knowing that those three organizations that you mentioned before aren't the only ones working with the community that might just be the only ones that are continuously funded, which is why we listed all the other ones in the previous slide. Um, and then we're working with our communities, we're not just thinking and talking about immigrant justice, but all of our issues, as you've talked about before, are so closely linked that if you want to are interested in labor justice or racial justice, educational justice or reproductive justice, we have all of these organizations already and these groups doing this type of work that are able to provide a lot of insight into the work that you're already doing to expand what that looks like for Memphis. Um, so when I mentioned earlier before, like if you're looking for other, like if you're in development looking for um, businesses in the community, if you're looking to add a more diverse board, um, you may look at the other side and see what other organizations may align with the work that you're already doing. Um, and maybe give them a call, have a cup of coffee. Maybe you go down to Summer Avenue and some eat some tacos at Tacos and Ganas. Um, and just learn what they're already doing and connect the work. And so together you can share and uplift their resources and leverage the power that you already have. Maybe letting go of a little bit of the power that you and your organization have and share that love around. I think the only thing I would add is, you know, again, thinking about everybody, everybody does have power. So when you make these connections, thinking about how can you make sure you are acknowledging the power and capacities that exist in individuals and in organizations um, and allowing them to bring in what they, what they already know, their expertise in what they already know. I think that's it, right? So there's, we'll share all of this with you. Our contact information is on here as well. Thank you all for having us. Can we have one more uh, round of applause for uh, the work and uh, just the willingness to be here by uh, Iris and Hisela. And I'm sorry, Jim was helping me keep track of the PowerPoint. We were, you, if you want to come back up here and keep going, we would yeah. welcome that for sure. <laughs> so sorry about that. And thank you, Jim, for keeping me on track. Where are you? Oh, you're at the piano. <laughs> Friends, um, as we go to a time where we celebrate our offering, um, there are, there are ways online on our website if you'd like to give to the life and ministry of Evergreen Presbyterian Church. Um, and then if you'd like to just leave a tangible offering, if you are worshiping here in person, there is an offering plate as you leave over on this table. Um, and additionally, as, as you think about what we can do to offer our resources, uh, I invite you to reflect on what you've heard today on those kinds of things that we can challenge ourselves, uh, offer our minds, our hearts, our resources. Um, to learning more and, and doing more for, uh, for justice in a variety of ways that we have been introduced to or maybe reminded of uh, this morning. And um, like our guest said, that information and those links will make sure that you have access to that when they end up in your inbox in the next day. Friends, let's reflect on what we can offer to God and to ourselves and to this community as we go to God with this, our offering.
invite you to pray with me. Spirit of the living God, we pray that the resources that we offer, whether it's our time, our talents, or our money, we pray that that goes to your dream for this world and not our own. In your many names we pray. Amen. to rise in body as we sing our closing hymn, God Be the Love to Search and Keep Me, found on page 543. Special thank you to everyone who made uh, this worship uh, possible. Um, to William for all of his help with our tech, for our special guests, for Keith and Renee for helping us set up, um, for the roses from Marty and for Pat and Jerry jumping in and having leadership. So thank you, thank you, thank you to all of you who have made this service possible. As you go from this place, May the peace of our subversive Savior, the grace of God, and the imagination of the wild living spirit be with you, nudging you, redeeming you, and even annoying you, now and always. And all God's people said, amen, because it's good news. Talk to me if you want to join the Pride Caravan. Hit it, Jim. Thank you, Marty. Right now, what? Um, well, we'll be in the caravan, but we not in the caravan. Last year, you know, how long did you do this? Oh, okay. Yeah, we did. The last one you gave me lasted forever and ever and ever. Okay. Uh, I'm 
I'm you know. glad you're here. Yeah. Glad I'm too. Patrick has somebody to play with. <laughs> yes, yeah, besides the fall. You don't want your chair, you want to keep yours. Yeah, I'm sorry I don't get to play out of hell. Oh, yeah. Okay, so yeah. you probably will be. Is this the, the host?